Rise and put your armor on, strong in the strength which God supplies. Strong in the strength which God supplies through His beloved Son. Stand in His great might with all His strength to do. But take to arm you for the fight. But take to arm you for the fight. The man of the young God. That I love this night. And for your conflicts past. You may have come through Christ's Welcome to all. This is a different part for me. We're supposed to be, oh, we already sang. I'm doing the welcome this morning. <laughs> I have to remind myself what, uh, what task I have been assigned, and gladly so. It is good to see all of you this morning, <clears throat> and it's uh, always good to be in the house of the Lord. And we have come into His house gathered in his name to worship him we have come into his house gathered in his name to worship him to worship christ the lord worship him jesus christ the lord so forget about yourself and concentrate on him and worship him forget about yourself and concentrate on him and worship him worship Jesus Christ the Lord we have some visitors today I've noticed some of you coming in and that's so good I think the Coles have some family in and a few others and hopefully there are some watching us on the live stream that we have folks that work very hard behind the scenes uh, in our church to make everything happy and enjoyable for us and we thank all of you that prepare lessons teach the kids teach the adults and things that we don't think about much but we should many prayer concerns <clears throat> for folks that are having difficulties physically and uh, logistically and we just all need to pull together every single day and even on not on Sundays but all days and, and pray for our church family and as we grow and we welcome you again dear Heavenly Father forgive us where we fail you and help us that we would today in this service listen to what the words are spoken that are spoken that you have given to us forgive us where we fail you in jesus name amen we worship and adore you bowing down before you songs of praise and singing hallelujahs ringing
this opportunity we have to gather here together this morning as we have and just so thankful for this blessing of being able to come near to you together and pray Heavenly Father that you would continue to be with us as we are here and help us to put everything else aside out of our minds and hearts so that we can stay close to you and stay focused on you and help us, Heavenly Father, to remember that it's not just the day that we get to do this. We can be near to you every day. Help us to do that. 
Heavenly Father, we have several uh, in our number who uh, especially need our prayers right now, uh, who are dealing with difficult things or, 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 or have some difficulties coming up or some uh, concerns coming up. We pray, Father, that you would be with those who've lost loved ones recently. Uh, Alan Payne and his family, uh, Naomi, uh, her family. We pray, Father, that you would especially be with them and, and their families and please comfort them and give them your peace uh, and your strength um, to get through this difficult time that they're facing right now. We pray that you would continue to be with those who are recovering at this time, uh, Beverly, um, Dean, uh, John, uh, Susan Honeycutt, and, and I'm sure there uh, are, are, are others that I'm failing to remember, but I'm comforted, Heavenly Father, we all are, that, that you are aware of those. And I just pray that you continue to be with them, continue to help them to recover and get back to uh, their normal good state. Of uh, health and be with those watching over them and, and tending to them at this time. Uh, we pray that you would be with those who, again, who have uh, appointments coming up. We pray that you be with Janice Stouter and her surgery that she's going to be having soon. And uh, just please give her comfort and peace as, as that time gets close. And we pray that it will go as, as good as it can possibly go, that it will solve uh, and fix the issue she's having and that you would help her to recover quickly from that procedure. Uh, and, and again, Heavenly Father, just any and all of those who are especially dealing with difficult times right now, again, some we may not even know of, uh, but we are again comforted that you do know what they're going through and please allow them to feel your comfort and your peace and your strength and your hope heavenly father we're so thankful for uh, the shepherds that we have here uh, we're so thankful for the deacons that we now have in place and the great work that they're doing and i pray heavenly father you would continue to be with our shepherds and our deacons show them what you would have them to do the decisions you would have them to make, uh, the work that you would have them to do, and then please give them the ability and the strength and the courage to, to do what you show them to do for the best of your church here. I pray, Heavenly Father, you would continue to be with Joe and Alan and I as we uh, work with your church here, and, and Adeline now as well, who's helping us this summer. Please continue to show us what you would have us to do and please give us the ability and the courage to, to do what you would have us to do. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would be with uh, each of our shepherds and deacons and our, our ministers' wives. Uh, they unfortunately seem to kind of be forgotten a lot of the time, but they go through just as much as any of the rest of us do and, and feel the pain and struggles that uh, that their husbands do and, and go through all that as well. So please be with them and uh, comfort them and give them strength uh, and peace as well. Again, please go with us through the rest of our time here together. We pray that uh, everything we do here today was, will be pleasing to you, that it will lift you up and glorify you as you deserve to be. And we, we know and we're thankful that it's going to be a blessing to us as well. We're so thankful for that. All of these things we pray in your Son's most precious and holy name. Amen. Jesus, name of God.
Luke, the beloved physician, gives us this passage in his gospel. When Jesus was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us when we talked with us on the road, and he opened the scriptures to us? Disappointment and discouragement marked the two believers who trudged the seven weary miles to Emmaus. They had hoped that Jesus would bring deliverance to Israel. But Jewish leaders sent him instead to a horrible death. So their hopes and dreams had come to a premature and bloody end. Even the women's discovery of an empty tomb did not lift their spirits. It only raised more questions and it increased their confusion. As these two despondent disciples, Cleopas and the other one who is unnamed, I tend to think it was probably Mary, his wife, who was the sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus. As they tramped that dusty road to their small village, Jesus joined them. Yet somehow they didn't recognize him. He asked them, what are you discussing as you're walking along? And Cleopas asked, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who doesn't know what has happened in these last few days? What things about Jesus? They replied, and they poured out their pain and di bitter disappointment, asking, we had hoped that he would be the one who would set us free. Yes, they had hoped, but no longer. They had stood at the bedside of hope for three days. But in the end, hope died. There had been no funeral. Nothing but a sense of confusion and loss. Have you ever experienced the death of hope? That's a bitter thing. When all the doors seem shut and barred, if you have, you can understand the disillusionment and defeat that broke the spirits of these two disciples. Jesus understood their disappointment. And so, beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained to them what the scripture said about the Messiah. With each explanation, the despondency and discouragement that had weighed on them lifted like the spring winds lift the clouds. They could sense their hearts coming alive again. Still not knowing who the stranger was, they urged him to stay the night. For the sun was about to set. An unexpected turn occurred when they served the evening meal. No longer the guest, Jesus assumed the role of host. He took bread, 
gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them, just like the Last Supper. Suddenly, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. Perhaps we too can see Jesus more clearly when we meet him at the table. We are all wayfarers on a pilgrimage to know Jesus more deeply. And the beauty is that he enter, enters our story just as he did these followers on the Emmaus Road. He does it when we take part in the Lord's Supper. And each time we meet him there, we catch another glimpse of who he is. At each encounter, we discern a different facet, gaining a new insight, and our hearts sing within us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this occasion when you are our host. You welcome us to your table. You provide us with bread. You provide us with more than that. You feed us. We thank you for this gift, your body, that you gave so willingly on the cross. We accept this gift with thanksgiving and with joy, and our hearts sing within us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray again. Father, for this cup, 
we are more than thankful. To us, the blood of Christ, which cleanses our sins now and forever. We thank you for that gift, that unbelievable gift that we each can share. And help us to share that today with one another. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray once more. Father, you ask so little of us, yet you give us so much. The dichotomy of that gulf is difficult to understand. We are so blessed through you. And we offer so little in return. Open our hearts and bless us as we return to you only what you have given to us. In Jesus' name, amen.
Our scripture reading this morning will be taken from Exodus uh, 34th chapter, beginning in verse 5 and reading through verse 7. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of their fathers to the third and fourth generation. All right, at this time we will dismiss our children to their Bible hour and the activity center behind us. Let's all stand together and sing the steadfast love of the Lord as they make their way. You're very bad. There's some rumbling going on. I'll probably get something out of order. <laughs> The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new and morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion and my soul. Therefore I will hope in him.
Thank you, Bob. He's always trying to keep us on our toes, isn't he? In more ways than one. Um, while I tell you uh, good morning and welcome to all those who are visiting with us uh, this morning. Uh, see if this uh, device actually works uh, for today. Um, we'll see if it does. Um, and while it ponders whether it's going to or not, I'll tell you a story about 20, almost 20 years ago in our um, little acre that we have east of Salado. Uh, I made a disturbing discovery one day on our uh, back property line. Uh, before this particular day of this discovery, there was not any real boundary separating our, our place, the back of our place, from our neighbor who has around three acres uh, just to the east of us. We're on, uh, we're on Prairie Lane uh, out here uh, east of town. But on this day, I found a very shoddy attempt had been made to put up a fence, if you could call it that. Uh, I have I have put up fence on many an acre uh, in the past, repaired a lot of fence, uh, so I can assure you this was not a very good job. Uh, but the real problem was, and it didn't take me long to observe this, the guy's meandering fence line was incurring in uh, our property. Uh, as much as a foot in some places. Uh, it was obvious he didn't use anything to make a straight line. Uh, he had just eyeballed it, and that was being generous, uh, really. Well, I, I didn't want to get into a boundary war, uh, and besides, there's nobody ever back there much, uh, a human being to, to contact or to talk to. Uh, so I called, uh, I phoned a friend. Uh, this was before phoning a friend was a thing. Uh, and this friend just happened to be uh, one who had worked in law enforcement in Bell County for many, many years. Happened to be a Christian brother of mine. Uh, some of you know who I'm going to say maybe. I call Tom Brown. Uh, if you didn't know who Tom Brown was, you missed a treasure. Uh, Tom and Maribel, uh, both dear, dear people uh, to us in this church family. Tom, a former elder. Uh, here in our church, good as gold, do anything for you uh, that you asked of him if he could. But he didn't take too kindly to folks breaking the law. He saw himself uh, and, and was seen as sort of an enforcer around uh, Bell County. Uh, you, you could have back in the day asked uh, Don Frazier, ask a lot of people about that, and he could tell you uh, stories uh, about Tom Brown. Spent a lot of time as a, I think, Temple PD and then Belton PD, but a lot more as a Bell County uh, Sheriff's Deputy. So he came out, and eventually he was able to talk to the person responsible for the not-so-acceptable fence uh, behind us. And I don't remember, I don't remember exactly how he did it, but I know that I got my boundary line back according to the survey pin. The guy had actually removed one of our survey pins. Um, and uh, but the other one was still there. So we got everything straightened out, more or less literally and figuratively. More, more figuratively than literally. Um, and I think it was justly and fairly done. And uh, to be fair, I don't believe that the guy had any malicious intent. I think he was just careless. Uh, he, was just, he was not being particular about where he put his, his fence post. Um, but I think even in such a fairly inconsequential matter, God wanted to see that it got right, and it was. When boundaries were moved in ancient Israel, and this is we have no we have no boundary stones remaining, I don't believe, actually from ancient Israel, but this is just, just an example for you to see here. When those boundary stones were moved, it was not a small matter. It was not an inconsequential matter kind of thing. Was it something that was done by accident or just a mistake? It was a serious matter and God attached serious consequences with it. Deuteronomy 19.14 is pretty clear that it was part of God's law that Moses is re-summarizing in the book that literally means second law. Notice what he says here. You shall not remove your neighbor's landmark. Other translations say boundary stone which the men of old have set in your inheritance, which you will inherit 
in the Lord or in the land the Lord your God is giving you to possess. There's a follow-up word on that in Deuteronomy 27, 17, in which moving the boundaries is just one among many sins for which the one who commits them will be considered under a curse. Notice, cursed is the man who moves his neighbor's boundary stone, and all the people shall say, Amen. In other words, let it be so. We agree that this is what should happen. He should be under a curse. Here's why moving boundary stones, their equivalent of survey pins today, why it was such a big deal. It was usually a matter of those who are richer seeking to expand their lands by defrauding their neighbors. That's what it was all about. And it made God angry. And the biblical writers pointed out bad things were going to happen to those who did so because they were making themselves accountable to God. Since Israel, uh, where every tribe and clan and family held that their land was an inheritance directly from God, since that was the case, the removal of one of those landmark stones marking that inheritance was seen as offense against God Himself, not just against the person. The Proverbs writer reaffirms this in 22-28. Do not move an ancient boundary stone set by your forefathers. Isaiah adds this word, and we'll come back to this in a moment. Woe to you who add house to house and join field to field till no space is left and you live alone on the land. What's happened there? Well, he's referring to one who is so busy moving the boundaries that he just, in essence, ends up kicking out the original landowner, the legitimate owner, so that all that's left is, is him the one who's kept moving the boundaries. When Hosea was condemning the leaders of Israel and Judah for their sins, he said, Judah's leaders are like those who move boundary stones. Hosea 5.10 So you get the idea. This is a practice that was roundly condemned and with serious consequences. The reason? The reason God is a God of love and mercy as He identified Himself through Moses Uh, to Moses there in Exodus 34, as you heard read earlier. But don't mistake, make the mistake of thinking that He's not also a God of justice. Yes, He's a God of grace and love and mercy. But He's a God of justice who will always be true to His nature and expect us to stick to that standard that He has set as well. So here's the point for today. There's not a bunch of points, there's just one. And that is, if God cared so much for people moving physical boundaries back in ancient Israel, thus defrauding their brothers and sisters, and was so concerned to make those wrongs right, do you think He's going to be any less concerned when we try and move His boundaries, spiritually speaking, today? When we try and say that something's no longer a sin, which from ancient times clearly has been defined by God as sin. Or that we can lessen the severity of something that is a serious offense to the very nature of God. Does God just simply say today something like, well, times are different now. And I've loosened up quite a bit over the years. Uh, I'm, I'm taking a more liberal stance on things today. I've I, I'm, I'm not as harsh as I once was. So within reason, you can just do what you want. Think about it. You know, Do any of us really expect that God is going to take a stance like that? One who cannot deny His nature in the sense of being untrue to it in any way? Well, the one who said through the prophet Malachi, as you see there, Malachi 3.6, I, the Lord, do not change. Will He do suddenly a 180 degree turnaround? Again, God was speaking there in this text of His nature as a gracious God. And in that context, He was saying to people at the time, you know, you guys can be really glad my nature doesn't ever change because if it did, you'd be dead by now. 
Now, I, I paraphrased a bit, but what he actually says is here uh, in this text, because I, the Lord, do not change, you descendants of Jacob are not destroyed. You're not consumed. Don't you love, by the way, that graphic for God? God is like that infinity line. He just goes, goes straight. His nature never changes. Look at what man otherwise does. Up and down, up and down, up and down. But God is the opposite of that. God's nature, His essential who He is, does not change in His, in His character, in His being. Okay, so directing us back to the main point today. To have us answer the question, can we move God's boundaries? The answer pretty simply is no. That is not something that's ever going to be at a pay grade for any of us in this room. Uh, that is something uh, way above anything we could ever do. If you would, turn over to Isaiah chapter 5, and we're going to spend a few moments there, returning to that passage that I mentioned. Uh, had it read by Carl last week, and Andy read it a second time that day during the shepherd's time. But we're going to look at a, a bigger portion of the text than just verses 18 through 21. That's what we read then. But essentially, we're going to see here in this chapter, chapter 5, Isaiah is telling Judah that they'll be led, led into captivity because of what they've been doing in a general sense, this very thing that we're speaking of. They have been spiritually moving boundaries that God had set up and obliterating others based on what they saw as their better perception or intellect. To put in our colloquial phrasing, Judah had gotten too big for their britches and too smart for their own good, too smart in their own eyes to be any good for God's purposes. So let's hone in a little more closely on specifically how they were setting themselves up for a fall. This theme of spiritually disenfranchising God, moving His boundaries, really takes up all this chapter, including the explanation of how it's going to take them into captivity uh, to Babylon. The prophet starts with a parable in the form of a song. And uh, if you start at the very beginning of chapter 5, talking about how God took Israel and planted her like a vineyard, how later Judah was the branches, the vines, in which he took particular pride at that time. And for all his planting and preparing and protecting, the vines ended up growing wild and unproductive. And so God promises here to take away their protection and the rains and all that goes with helping something to grow and ended up ending up destroying these uh, vines, this vineyard. There's a series of woes that he goes through uh, with the prophet or has the prophet take them through. Beginning in verse 8 with the one I mentioned earlier, this same idea of defrauding people by cheating them out of their lands uh, and homes. There's the uh, more updated uh, translation of this. Those that put field to field till there's no more living space uh, for any but themselves in all the land. Some woes are to those who are just spiritually imperceptive and arrogant, and on those who say things like, let God hurry. Let Him, let him hurry to His work so that we can see it. That's verse uh, 19. Uh, here's, the, uh, here's that verse. Uh, those folks were a lot like the scoffers of Peter's day that he addresses in 2 Peter chapter 3. You remember they said things like, where is this, where is this coming, Peter? that you say God's going to make. We, he hasn't appeared yet. When is He going to come? What, what is He going to ever do? As if they were skeptical, God would ever act. Same thing here in Isaiah 5. If He's for real, if He's going to do something, let Him go ahead and do it. You remember the expression, be careful what you wish for? Isaiah lets these folks know uh, you know, God is going to act, but you're not going to like it. You're not going to like the ways in which He's going to act. And then there's the woe 
uh, we read of last week in verse 20, and I'll just combine it uh, in the next slide with verse 21. So here's both those last two woes that he pronounces. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light, light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And then the last one, woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. So what's the dreadful summary of all of this? Isaiah 5, among other places in his prophecy, tells us that Judah brought their fate completely down upon their their own heads. They did this to themselves. They had no one else to blame for being taken into captivity. They broke faith with God. They were arrogant. They were self-centered, self-indulgent, abusive to their own people with their injustices. They were perverse, wanting to go after things that were evil while turning their backs on the things which are good. So, in short, what they did was, in effect, they were moving the boundaries God had set for their good, their protection, and to preserve justice. They moved some boundaries, they obliterated others. And to the extent that you have people today who willfully say to God, black is white, and vice versa, we have, we have the same thing happen. We see this very same thing with lives of self-indulgence. People are making their own rules about what's right and what's wrong today and doing the same things all the way down the line of which Judah was found guilty and convicted. We're calling, and I say we because we are a society of people in which this is happening, We're calling murder of our unborn babies simply a matter of choice. Choice has become God to a lot of folks in our world today. And the same with our various sexual choices and decisions about lifestyle and preferences. We treat sexual relations casually. When Paul, in places like 1 Corinthians 6, says they're anything but, we believe we should be acceptable to God with any choice we make that's right for us. We live to excess and we don't care who gets hurt in the process of greed and injustice in every way in which Judah did it. Right down the line. Our society and those around us who care nothing for God and His will are thumbing their nose at God and His guardrails that He set up for a reason. They're moving his boundaries or just outright wiping them out as of no consequence to them. Here's where the rubber meets the road. Remember the one point from today. If you remember nothing else, there's only one. Can we move God's boundaries and have him be okay about it? Can we can we start treating evil as good and good as evil and not expect him to notice or care? The answer is, it always has been, no. Unequivocally, no. In the context of playing around with sexual sin, the Proverbs writer says, can you play with fire and not expect to get burned? The answer is no way. Mark it down, it's going to happen. There are consequences involved with acting and living in ways that God has said are transgressions against him. And unless those who have moved those boundaries God set up moves them back in repentance and seeks God's forgiveness, the consequences are much harder than just the little slap on the wrist my neighbor got from the sheriff's deputy for moving his fence into our land. The consequences will be eternal. Now, if you're interested in more specifics or even if you're not, We're going to go there within the next several weeks. Uh, But for now, the message is yours. I picked the songs around the message for reason. God has been so merciful. God has been so good in every way to us. How can we, in answer to that, in response to that, tell Him, because it fits our lifestyle better, what's wrong and what's right. How can we move 
or change what His Word says, what the standard says for us. We can't. We can't do that. If we as family can help you make something right in your life that is not right with Him and move closer to a right relationship with Him, uh, with His family, uh, you need help, need help to do that today. We urge you to make that Occasions when the shepherd of the day gets preempted, and that's Billy today. So I've warned him about that ahead of time. Uh, that we are welcoming uh, a new family uh, today. Uh, they're sitting over here to my right, so I'm going to ask them to stand. I guess the girls are in Bible hour, right? Still. So, so uh, yeah, okay, <laughs> all right. Travis and Dana, please stand. This is Travis and Dana Parks. <clears throat> And their girls are next door, Ellie and Emma, correct? Uh, I'm not sure who the older of the two is, which is, Ella's is the older, okay, all right. So um, let me tell you the story. Um, y'all can go ahead and be, and be seated. Um, tell you the story, and I hope I'm getting this story right, but the Parks are here with us, and they've, a lot of you have gotten to know them. Uh, they've gotten in with our, our lift group uh, that Radon leads, and, and uh, um, they're here because, and it works, it, it's proof that it works for someone to ask someone to come to church with you. Right, Irene? Where's Irene? Uh, because they're next door neighbors, right, to Irene Lyle uh, and Carol's sister uh, back here. And so Irene asked them uh, to worship one day. Am I telling the story right? Uh, sort of? No? Close enough. Uh 
anyway, for their connection, uh, the uh, parks found us, and we're thankful. We're thankful that they did. Uh, and they've been they've been here practically every time the doors have opened since. I think since they uh, since they found us uh, and started uh, plugging in to what's going on in the church here. So we're thankful uh, for that. Uh, let's go to God in prayer for a moment. Father, we are thankful today in welcoming uh, Travis and Dana and Ellie and Emma into our church family. Father, help us to incorporate them in, in every way, fully in work and worship uh, and involvement in uh, all the things that we're striving to do for you uh, from this particular body of believers here in Salado. And uh, help us to help them in any ways that we can and encourage them in their uh, walk of faith and uh, raising their girls and uh, uh, as they are an encouragement to us as well. Um, Father, help us to use opportunities that we have to uh, get to know each other, to grow closer together um, in, uh, in love and knowledge of each other and knowledge of you uh, as, we, as we share together, as we have opportunities. Uh, and Father, bless us to continue to be helped uh, by different ones who've come our way to add to the things that we can do to further shed your light, uh, be your light uh, in this community of believers. Uh, we pray all these things uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Billy may mention this, but I'll just say one of those opportunities that we have to get to know each other better and draw closer together is coming up next Sunday morning, and that is our fifth Sunday fellowship. You read about that in the bulletin, so keep that in mind. That last part was one of my prompts. Uh, <laughs> I think Joe has sent in an email, or perhaps even the bulletin, I forget, he sent some of the details about this fifth Sunday uh, luncheon that we have it, it's this next Sunday of course but if there are questions I think he says contact Kay I believe that's I believe that's what I read somewhere uh, Kay Jackson coordinates this for us and she has women signed to all things every time and, and she kind of coordinates this whole thing for us but if indeed you know women uh, that are involved, uh, latch on and come ahead because there's a whole lot going on. A lot of help is needed. I was going to ask if the summer was over, but certainly it's not. Um, there are too many people here visiting, families visiting family here. And that usually happens before the summer is over. Uh, there was a time, uh, more than one family, I think I've seen them. Quite, quite a number of visitors. Uh, there was a time, though, and some of you would remember, uh, that, that the summer wasn't over. School didn't start until after Labor Day. Now, think about that. After Labor Day, that's September. We still have August to go. Uh, as I was growing up, I thought summer was half the year. Um, honestly, I did. Uh, and I... I played the game that way. Summer was half the year, and, and I, after Labor Day, we went back to school. Um, but times change. Maybe the boundaries have been changed. I'm not sure, Joe. But, uh, we're glad to have all of you, and, and certainly they're both visiting with us, and, and family are glad to, to see family here, I'm sure. But we appreciate your coming today and being with us. Others that are visiting with us, we, we especially want to welcome you and make you feel warmly received here. Uh, we continue to add many to our number. Uh, we hope to be able to get to know you as, as time goes by a little better than I presently know you. Uh, but we want to thank you for being with us and be willing to join us here in what's going on here in this church in Salado. Uh, let's pray together. We have a church here that prays a lot. We have special emphasis and focus on prayer in so many different ways, but indeed we need to pray together. And, and I want you to join me now in, in prayer as we close this service.
Holy Father, we're thankful today for the experience of our being together in this place at this time in your presence. We pray, Father, that even as we conclude this time together, that you will continue to be with us, that you will continue to bless us as even you have this hour. That our Lord Jesus will be with us as we leave, that we might continue to be in touch. Keep us aware, Father, that you're never too far from us, that you're with us in all things that challenge and test us, that we cannot do these things alone. And we pray that you would continue to bless us with your presence and your power in our lives. We seek to be your children. We seek to be yours completely. Help us, Father, that we might surrender totally to your spirit within us that guides us, that we might seek in every day those things that you would have us seek, that we would recognize, Father, that we pursue your purpose for each of us in our lives, that indeed we might live to serve your purpose. Draw us close, Father. Help us to realize that we're never alone and that we indeed have strength as we are together. We continually, Father, to pray for unity among us in this family, that you would unite us all the more, that you would strengthen our love for one another, that we might seek to be your children totally unified in this place, that we might accomplish your purpose in this place. Forgive us, Father, where we've fallen short, where we're, we're pretending to stray. Draw us back together and keep us strong as we're together. Help us, Father, to realize the strength that we have because we belong to you. Our Lord Jesus, Father, we thank you for saving us. We thank you for pulling us together as you have here. Father, we're mindful of all things going on that are disturbing, that are troubling. We know in all these things, Father, that you have a purpose that you see these things happening and know full well what's lying ahead. Uncertain as we are, Father, we need you to, to encourage us. We need you to strengthen us from day to day that we might know that you are yet in charge. Bless our nation. Bless those who serve in, in whatever way they may serve, Father, that we might have a common purpose in our time. We seek peace, Father, and we know it's nothing but chaotic at this point. Keep us, Father, calm and keep us aware of your presence and find peace in your presence always. Thank you, Father, for blessing us today. These things we ask in the name of Jesus and offer you in our prayer as we, as we have today. Thank you, Father. I want to read to a short verse, but not unfamiliar to us. In Ephesians chapter 3, there's, there's several verses there that could be read, but in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask, or think, according to power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall its praise begin? Taking away my burden, setting my spirit.